Hello, Internet. I'm Evan Dushevsky, Features Editor with PCMag.com. Welcome to the convo. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the world falling apart, kind of, sort of. The global situation as weird and chaotic at any point in my 38 years on this earth. <laughs> uh, it feels that way anyway. Uh, so I first became politically aware in the 1980s and 90s. So I grew up thinking that politics would always be small, remote, petty, and kind of boring. Remember Travelgate? I miss Travelgate. Uh, uh, we've come a long ways in, from Travelgate. So what's causing all these upheavals? Now I'm biased, so I see technology as the engine driving events. Uh, but I'm not naive enough to believe that it's the only thing. So in order to dig a little deeper, I wanted to talk to someone a lot smarter than myself. Today's guest is one of my go-to dudes when, it comes to, when I want to get some clarity on global events. Um, he is the best-selling author, Washington Post columnist, a, co a consultant on HBO's uh, Vice show, which is great, and he's a host of CNN's Fareed Zakaria GPS. Fareed Zakaria, welcome to The Convo. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, now, for those of you at home, the show is called The Convo, not The Dialogue. So if you have any questions, ask them in the comments. And Social Jose, filling in for Social Pete today, will read them throughout the show. Um, and if you're listening or watching After the Fact or listening on the podcast and you still have a, f a question for Fareed, as always, too bad. <laughs> okay, so today we're, let's, let's talk about jobs and the economy. Um, it's, you know, big hot topic. Um, now there's a lot of talk about specifically how Trump wants to bring back manufacturing jobs. Um, and now a lot of things, uh, and there's an important fact that we should talk about is that U.S. manufacturing is actually doing quite well. The last time I checked, it's, we're, we're producing about three times as much stuff as we did in the 70s but employing about a third as many people because our robots are so great. So it seems like we are opening these new factories or tr as Trump's plan, but we're filling them with German and Korean robots. Um, I don't know. Uh, and now automation is also starting to get into the, the service sector and maybe even will replace Facebook Live guests that uh, hosts at one point. Um, how fearful are you of technological unemployment? I'm pretty fearful, actually. Okay. I think that it's a, it's a, a, a real problem because I do see the power of technology, and mm -hmm. I think it's accelerating at a pace that most people don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, I think the examples you give are exactly right. So Adidas is, I, I think, starting a new factory mm -hmm. in Atlanta. It's going to be their largest factory outside of Germany. Uh, it's just to, uh, for the U.S. market, mm -hmm. uh, and they, you know, they make shoes, not fancy, you know, kind of computer products. They make shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe they're going to employ a hundred people. Wow! And those hundred people, I think. From what I could tell, about 50 to 60 are highly specialized, technically trained software engineers or electrical engineers. In other words, this is not what you think of when you think of manufacturing jobs, when you think of people making shoes. Mm -hmm. These are people who operate highly complex, highly expensive machines mm -hmm. or the software that runs these machines. Uh, Mark Andreessen, I think, wrote the most important uh, article about that kind of underlies this phenomena that we're explaining. Mm -hmm. He did a long blog post about five years ago that, that was called Software Eats the World. You uh -huh. probably remember it. And his basic point was, if you think we've gone through a computerization and automation, you ain't seen nothing yet. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is everything is now being run by software. Mm -hmm. And software has inherent tendency, uh, tendencies towards massive productivity increases the way hardware doesn't. So I'll give you an example. Alcoa runs these uh, aluminum furnaces. Uh, aluminum furnace you think of as an old-fashioned thing. Yeah. And they used to be guys who would you know, kind of manually adjust the temperature every minute or two to make sure it was within the range. Yeah. Well, now what they have is software running the furnace. Mm -hmm. And the software adjusts the temperature a hundred times a minute, right. maybe a thousand times a minute, right? And so I've asked, th I asked at the time the CEO of Alcoa, what do you do with the guy? What yeah. do you do with the guy who used to do that? And he said, this is our principal problem. That person is just in the way. Yeah. We've got to figure out, honestly, a way to just get these people out of the way and let the machines run. Mm -hmm. Because now software is running what used to be considered these old-fashioned, hard manufacturing, you know, industrial mechanisms, processes, machines. And their productivity, of course, is increasing roughly double every 18 months, roughly price falling to half. Mm -hmm. That's the new world. Right. And so that means I think you're going to see much, much greater pressure on jobs than we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. And I really do think it's a kind of you ain't seen nothing yet right. because these Adidas factories are the beginning. Mm -hmm. There are still a lot of old-fashioned factories out there that are going to start looking more and more like the Adidas factory. Mm -hmm. So let's maybe talk about some solutions. Now, uh, the solution that Silicon Valley elites are kind of like all excited about, at, at, at least at present, is universal basic income. Um, 
So basically, uh, let's, that's just giving people money. So everyone makes the same amount of money, and maybe we'll work less. Maybe we'll all work part time. Maybe we'll have a four day work week, which I think sounds great. <laughs> um, I don't know. Do you think? Uh, do you think that's a good solution, or is there others? What other solutions yeah. should we have? You know, I'm not as crazy about that as, as some people. I like the spirit of it. I think that it gets at the fundamental problem, which mm -hmm. is. You're going to have a small number of people generating a huge amount of the wealth. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of people servicing those people, let's be honest. I mean, you know, whatever you want to call them, the, the, the low-level service economy, mm -hmm. cooks, gardeners, drivers, uh, massage therapists, whatever. Mm -hmm. But there is going to be a large bunch of people in the middle, and what do you do with them? Mm -hmm. I think that in the long run, it's quite possible that there will be jobs. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, if you look at per capita GDP in Britain, mm -hmm when the Industrial Revolution hit. I think I have this number roughly right. For 75 years, it didn't go up. Yeah. And then it went up. And, the, you know, so it could be that we're in a bad 75 years or yeah. maybe a bad 30 or 40 years and things will eventually sort themselves out. But what do you do for that period? I think the danger of a, of a universal basic income is uh, work is not just about money. Mm -hmm. It's about a calling, a profession, a life. Mm -hmm. And I hate to to put it this way, but I do think it's true that particularly for men, yeah. men derive a lot of their identity mm -hmm. from what they do. Yep. And so you have to give them something to do. And so what I like is uh, are the series of things that you can do to kind of bolster people's income and support systems so that they, even if they don't make that much money, mm -hmm. they don't fall through the cracks. Single best government program that exists in, in America without any question is the earned income tax credit. Okay. And you know, it's, a, it's one of these weird things where it literally doesn't catch on more because it's so wonky and difficult to explain. Yeah. But it's actually quite simple. What the government says is if you work a full-time job mm -hmm. and, you, and you make under the poverty level, mm -hmm. we just top up your wages because we don't believe anyone who works full-time should, should be under the poverty line. Mm -hmm. So what it does is, is, what I like about it, there's no disincentive to work. There's no reason why you would say, oh, I'm just gonna sit around doing nothing. No, you work, but you know you top it up. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to do more of that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to expand Obamacare so that you have really good quality health care that's mm -hmm. affordable. I'd like to provide, we spend about 120th as much as the Germans do on job retraining and things like that. I'd like to create like a GI Bill-like thing which says, you lose a job because of globalization, technology, whatever it is, you can go to any community college in the country and mm -hmm. say, I want six months worth of retraining, and you tell me, what are the jobs in the area that are available? Mm -hmm. Is it welding? Is it what, you know, whatever it is, then the industry kind of helps in that regard, but the government pays for it. Mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very sensible idea in my view. The reason that nobody wants to do it is it ain't cheap. Right, it's right. a very expensive idea. Right. And in order to do that, you'd have to raise taxes. So I'd like to see like five or six such programs. Mm -hmm. You would probably end up in the same place as the UBI if you were to net out what the income would be. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's such a bad thing for people to have to hustle a little right, to get right. that to get that money. Right. You know, you've got to fit, you've got to know what you're doing. You've got to try and work. You've got to try and get retrained. Mm -hmm. You've got to try and get you know good health care. And if you could do all that, um, yeah, you you would end up in a situation where even though you either didn't work a lot mm -hmm. or you didn't work at things that somehow the market right now was rewarding, mm -hmm. you wouldn't fall through the cracks. Well, we're talking like now with, with that solution about people who are kind of like in the market or having when the big disruption happens. Let's talk about how we raise like, you know, the little people who are going to be coming up in this job market. No one knows what this job market is going to look like. So it, like education is just this big question mark. Um, now, a lot, one of the big things people want to push for good reasons, and we're big fans here, is STEM. Uh, so we're big pushers of, of STEM too. Um, you actually wrote a book about, in defense of liberal education, about we shouldn't lose sight of the liberal education. I totally agree. Now, I've brought this up on the show before in other places that we can't, that the humanities are an important thing we can't uh, let go of. Um, and I get pushback. So maybe, can you just give the, maybe the, the elevator pitch for, for your book? Sure. And, um, and let's talk about how that can be a, a partner with STEM. Sure. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's no question STEM is important. Yeah. I've all, my whole life I've wanted, you know, I've thought STEM is important. Mm -hmm. I'm a dad, I have three kids. Yeah. My kids all had to do extra math, and you know, I'm not much of an Asian dad, but I, enough that I said to them, that's sort of almost like one language yeah. you need to learn in addition to a foreign language, which yeah. is math. You just need to be comfortable with math. And, you know, and I think it's actually important to not be scared of it and to be, and to be conversant in it. And then you realize, actually, you don't need 
super brainy math mm -hmm. to function in the world well. I mean, if you look at what most business executives are dealing with in corporate balance sheets and stuff, it's just arithmetic. Right. I mean, unless you're building rockets or, do, or building financial derivatives, you're not using calculus for yeah. anything. I've, I've always thought that you know, people should be taught basic statistics before they're taught calculus because it's much more useful in life. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is a lot of what makes you succeed in life and what, a lot of what makes you succeed in the world mm -hmm. are, are things that are not just related to STEM. Mm -hmm. They are how to think clearly, how to express yourself clearly, how to write clearly, mm -hmm. um, how to be able to put things in context, how to know, you know what this phenomenon looks like compared to others, so history, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and there's a whole creative dimension to us that, that, that is important. I would argue that we're actually entering a phase where those traits that I just described are going to be more important mm -hmm. because computers are increasingly able to do routine coding. Mm -hmm. Computers are able to do some of those rote, you know, repetitive things that people used to learn uh, technical skills for. What the computer can't do is be human. And, yeah. you know, and we're going to, there's a kind of a, it's a bigger issue I'm raising. What does it mean to be human? Right. But surely some of it is this, uh, these creative skills, these soft skills, these contextual skills. And the final one is working together. You probably see this. Um, people, you have to be able to, people have to want to work with you. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible skill in life, to know how to make it so that people want to work with you. Mm -hmm. And that you pick up through social skills, which are developed you know, in, in various ways. But again, the, the, a liberal arts education, which by the way, includes the sciences from its origins, always meant the sciences, it just meant not technical trade school. Um, I think you've got to be able to do all of that. And so don't lose sight of that. Right. I, I think that there are some people who are technically uh, proficient and enjoy it, and they should absolutely do engineering, computer science, whatever. Mm -hmm. There are others who don't. Each should know a little bit about each other's field. I think we're in a hybrid world. But if you listen to Jobs' great line when he, when he announced the, uh, the iPod, uh, or the iPhone, I think it was, mm -hmm. he said the DNA of Apple and what makes it special is that we marry technology to the liberal arts. Right. And I think it's that, that's the sweet spot, marrying technology to the liberal arts. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we think of like, you know, uh, the great explosion that from Silicon Valley and things like that, um, we have all the technical, and we have like an open free market which has allowed that to happen. True, and we have a, a very large market that they were able to work in. But we actually have a very um, fine arts uh, tradition and, and humanity tradition. You know, you have your, uh, you know, every school has like puts on their play productions. They have art classes right. usually or music and right. they're just part of the culture. And I want to say, and maybe I'm overselling it a bit, I want to say that that culture mixed with all the other stuff has allowed, say, Silicon Valley, to, like the apples of the world to happen. Because like Apple, Google, Facebook, they're not in Europe. They're not in South Asia. They're not in China. They're here. And I think there's a reason for that. Am I overselling it? So if you listen to Jack Ma talk about this, um, okay. he agrees with what you said exactly. Okay. And his argument is American education knows how to emphasize, he calls it uh, having fun. Right. And I don't think it's just what he doesn't mean, if you listen carefully what he's saying. He's saying being creative, mm -hmm. uh, letting you, you know, using your entire range of interests, passions, emotions. Uh, and those actually come out much more in the humanities than they do in the, in the, in the technology, in, in you know, learning me mechanical engineering or something. Mm -hmm. That stuff is very important. I, again, I don't want to suggest in any way what I'm talking about excluding it. Right. But you really you need a value add today. I mean, I think everybody understands that you can't do just something that's rote mem memorization, rote repetition. Mm -hmm. And the value add, I think the American educational system has always had, is that it is more creative. Mm -hmm. It is more uh, adventurous. It, 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 uh, it makes people get passionate about what they just, a simple thing like you go to college in America, you study whatever you want, right. both semester to semester, major to major. I don't think most people realize when you go to college anywhere else in the world, you choose either one subject or three subjects. Those, yeah. are, your, those are your options. And most of the world is one subject. Yeah. You, know? and you go to Oxford, you read physics or you read history, or you, and that's what you do for three years. Mm -hmm. right? Think about how different the American system is. That's what you're getting at, I think. Yeah. It's that system that has allowed people to play, mm -hmm. have fun, as Jack Ma says, and as a result, find these things that are, you know, both playful, but also in some way technologically advanced. Right. Um, if you get a little into uh, philosophy here, um, is there something that you think a computer will never be able to do? You know, that's the, the hardest question, honestly, okay. that I think we all uh, confront. So 
I, in my gut, probably like most of us, yeah. I do believe that. I do believe there's something deeply, innately human okay. that a computer is not going to be able to do. So when I try to come up with answers and I say, well, you know, like write a beautiful piece of music that is soulful. Vinod Khosla will tell me, you know, the, the, the Silicon Valley venture capitalist, uh, he says, well, actually, there are computer programs mm -hmm. now that can produce these pieces of music that are so fine that people can't tell that they were done by computers. They win in competitions. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very interesting thing that Watson did recently uh, where it edited a trailer. Now, right. you think that that's kind of okay with calculus. No, it's actually a trailer of a movie is an art because right. you're taking a two-hour movie and you're trying to figure out what is the sensibility. I'm trying to evoke it with the audience. I've got one minute, 45 seconds, or three minutes, whatever it is, and I'm going to put together some kind of montage that evokes a spirit of feeling and, you know, and an urge to see the movie. Right. So it was always considered one of the great technical skills that really creative editors have to do, where they marry the creativity with the technical. Mm -hmm. Well, the computer has done it now. And does it very well. Mm -hmm. And this is all part of that deep neural learning mm -hmm. where the computer is now shown, you know, a million trailers right, right. and told, okay, here's the movie, here's the trailer, and now you, you get it, you get it, you get it, and then the computer mat matches in a sense. So then what does that leave us with? Right. Um, I think some of the things that I, I, I think about are empathy. Uh -huh. uh, so for example, doctors, you think to yourself, uh, the computer is going to be able to diagnose better than, than any doctor. Mm -hmm. But this is now, it, it's anyone who thinks otherwise is just not being logical. Right. No doctor can remember more than a couple hundred articles, a couple hundred cases. The computer, Watson, looks at two to three million every second, right, right. right? And so how could you possibly do a better diagnosis looking at, you know, you have the markers from the blood test. Mm -hmm. You're going to make some half ill-informed decision, in red, red, you know, now that we know. And the computer is going to look at literally every yeah, yeah. possible permutation. Of course, the computer is going to do better. But we have very good evidence that people do better. They perform better. They recover better. Mm -hmm. they are, they are, you know, and they have a better life if they have a doctor who is like a life coach, yeah. you know, who kind of psychologically equips them for, let's say, dealing with cancer and the chemo and things like that, who understands how to you know, hold their hand, walk them through what they have to do, talk them through what they have to do. Those are skills that might be more human. Mm -hmm. They might be actually more important in some ways, or at least they have to be used in supplement. Mm -hmm. So I think medical schools need to figure this out and realize that they need to have their medical students read more novels right. and do more you know, kind of social you know, psychology right. and think about those issues and not just sit there focusing obsessively on diagnosis because guess what? The end of the day, the computer is going to do that better, right. but the computer can't hold somebody's hands better than you can. Right. You know? uh, well, let's also talk about technology's uh, effects on politics, your realm. Um, Am I right to say, uh, I'm 38 years old, am I right to say that this is the most divided we've been in, say, the last 40 years as a country? Oh, the data is un 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 absolutely okay. clear. We are more divided than we have ever been as a country, uh -huh. with the exception of basically the 10 years around the Civil War. Right, right. So, the, you know, yes, it was worse when we went through That's the Civil War. Uh, 600,000 people died. And we're died. still fighting the Civil yeah, War, apparently. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the country almost you yeah, know, yeah. broke it into two. Other than that, yeah. this is the worst we've ever been. Yeah, um, now I actually... I think technology is a bit of a, um, a reason for that, and I think it's a lot of it is social media, is the democratization of, demo of, of the media. It sounds like a great thing, um, but everyone has a voice, including people who shouldn't have a voice, perhaps, or it's at least not amplified voice. And also, it's, you know, we're all in our own little bubbles, and I don't think there's a way out of it. I yeah, think it's, this yeah. is it. I think, I, think that's, I think you're right. Yeah. I think that the biggest part, the biggest problem is the bubble part. Yeah. Because I think the other stuff, look, everyone has a voice. Of course they should, and there's nothing wrong. And look, it means all of us, yeah. we have to hustle a little more for audience. If, yeah. you, if, you work, you know, if you worked in one of the three big papers or the three big networks in the old days, you kind of had a captive audience. Yeah. And that meant you also had to be a little bit more boring and bland, and yeah. now you can be you know, sh sharp and pointed. But you gotta, you know, everyone's hustling for, this, for, for some sliver, sliver of the audience. Yeah. That's fine, that's, that's the reality. What's sad is that we've gotten to this point where we have so segregated ourselves yeah. that we l really only want to hear what we agree with. We yeah. only want to hear things that confirm everything we, we already believe. The confirmation bias problem has become just massive. Yeah. 
And I wonder how much of that, honestly, is technology. The technology certainly enables it. Yeah. But if you look at broader phenomena in, in society, we increasingly live uh, close to people we agree with politically. That never happened before. I and mean, you look at the sort that's taken place, mm -hmm. you know, we have sorted ourselves into essentially metropolitan areas around the coast or big cities mm -hmm. where college educated or semi college educated graduates live, work, play together. Yeah. And they all tend to agree politically. And then you have the non or less educated people living more rural areas and they tend to live, live together. Even if you look at the Washington suburbs, which used to be very mixed, now you have a Bethesda that is essentially 90% Democratic. Yeah. You have a McLean, Virginia that is 90% Republican. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think of the oddity of Donald Trump, uh, I think that the uh, Manhattan went 98 to 2 for Hillary Clinton or right, something right, like right. that, some crazy number like that. Right? That, those kind of numbers never happened before. Right. So that's not about technology. That's about social sorting yeah. that's taken place. And, and a kind of elite sorting that's, that's taking place through this kind of meritocratic system where college has become the marker of social status and people who, you know, just kind of divides people. Those are the kind of broader social for forces. Technology certainly enables mm -hmm. and it makes it possible for you to consume only what that, that which you want and the other yeah. stuff. But I sometimes think to myself, I, when I'm being hopeful, it, it's not just the technology. If we could get at the other piece, yeah. if we could get at some leadership or some structures that unified us more mm -hmm. or that brought us together more, maybe that could change. I mean, the one thing I notice is we live increasingly so apart yeah. in every sense um, that it's, that's, it's very sad. I look at a country like Singapore. Uh, Singapore has this mandated, 90% of people in Singapore live in public housing. Mm -hmm. That's a something they did because they're a very small island city-state. Mm -hmm. And in those public housing units, which are quite lavish, they go from one bedroom to five bedroom penthouses, mm -hmm. you have to have an ethnic mix. Okay. You have to have, in Singapore is about 75% Chinese, about 15% Malay, 10% Indian, something like that. And that mix has to be replicated in every housing block. Okay. And if you ever got, go below, they actually have a mechanism. At that point, you can only sell to a Chinese person or Indian person. Mm -hmm. Because they want people to live together mm -hmm. and they want the kids to go to school together. Okay. So 95% of all Singapore uh, kids go to uh, public schools. Mm -hmm. And so they're living and experiencing life together. That's what we don't do anymore, mm -hmm. you know? And that's because we segregate on the basis of, uh, of income and because we fund the public school system through local taxes, mm -hmm. which means that you never see people, you never at a parents meeting with, with you know, with people who are vastly different from you, and and I think that just makes it so you you don't understand these people, you right. don't know their lives, you don't know and that, that that to me is the part you can fix. You're not going to uninvent narrow casting technology. Yeah. That's going that's with us, but we could do something about these other issues. Yeah. Uh, Facebook, you have a question. What would you recommend for let's say someone who's suffering from news fatigue? How would they keep, <laughs> like, news in touch fatigue? With the world watch, listen to, and read absolutely nothing other than my Sunday show. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean honestly, I feel that way sometimes too, which is that the day to day can just be overwhelming and it's too much. So I mean honestly, I, I find the Economist is this you know fantastic end of week uh, recap that that kind of separates the signal from the, the noise. Mm -hmm. I try to do that on my show. Try to find things like that, mm -hmm. you know, where you feel like you've got somebody who's saying to you, I'll, I'll live in this media swamp for you, and, in, and I'll tell you what's important. And there are places like that, and I, but I know exactly what you mean. It can be overwhelming, and it can feel like you're just, it's just accumulating trivia. You're just like, you know, it's one more twist of the story, one more turn, but what, what's really important? What is the signal here? What is the trend? Uh, President Donald Trump, you've heard of him. Uh, he hates you guys. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of just weird that you guys are being pointed out like that. But I don't know, have you guys taken, and probably even before Trump took office or even won, have people in your industry and at your company taken digital security a lot more uh, uh, seriously. Do you find people are doing the, the two-factor authentication, getting into encryption and things like that? Is that uh, just, it just goes without saying now? Uh, a very, really interesting question. So we got much more serious about digital security after the Sony hack. Okay. So we've become much, much better about it and lots of pr processes and procedures for it. Mm -hmm. um, 
The Trump thing is kind of a slightly different phenomenon. Yeah. So I give you an example in my case. Um, I have a re reasonably large Twitter following and Facebook following. I've got about, mm -hmm. I think, 900,000 Twitter uh, followers. So it's not huge, huge, yeah. but it's, you know, decent size. And I would say my Twitter feed would be 2% racist okay. a year ago. You know, there's, there's kind of straggling comments that, you know, and I'd never thought much of it. Yeah. I've really never experienced any problems like that. I've been in America 35 years. Mm -hmm. um, it's now about 30%. Wow. Racist. I mean, it's racist, bigoted, you know, go back, you dirty immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, it, sometimes it's about my race, sometimes it's about my religion, sometimes it's about my national origin. Mm -hmm. And that is all in the last year. Right. It's all since the, ca the campaign. It's all, you know, a product, I think, of the fact that you have, you had one major presidential candidate, mm -hmm. the nominee, and now the president, essentially kind of licensing it, saying, right. it's okay, I'm going to talk about Mexican ra rapists, I'm going to talk about Muslims in this way, and so you can too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, some of that has gotten quite nasty. Right. I've gotten, you know, people have, you know, uh, put down my home wow. um, address, they yeah. put down my phone number, I've got l l young kids. Uh -huh. And so, I, you know, I worried a lot about it. Ultimately, I decided for the most part not to do much in terms of extra security measures, okay. because you know, I don't want to live my life that way. Yeah. And it's very constraining. I had to do it, ironically, I had to do it for a little while while I was at Newsweek right after 9-11. Right. Because I wrote a couple of very tough cover stories about the Arab world and the Muslim world and mm -hmm. what they needed to take responsibility for. Mm -hmm. uh, and a crazy imam in, in London issued a fatwa against me. Okay. And so the FBI got kind of worried. And so for yeah. a while I had to do, and it's just, you know, it's very constraining. It's like not what I want to do with my life. And I yeah. don't want to give in to it. So I've just had a couple of very serious conversations with my kids, mm -hmm. explained to them, don't pick up the phone, don't answer the doorbell. If something happens, let me know immediately. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Uh, and it's sad, you know, I mean, they're 9 and 14. I, I wish I didn't have to do that. Right. But, but um, you know, and, and, and then you have the issue of, you know, all that bile that's still piling through the, the Twitter. And I console myself because I think it's true mm -hmm. that who knows how many people are actually generating that stuff. Right, right. A lot of it is bots. A yeah, lot of yeah. it is, you know, probably five people sitting around creating yeah. kids. So, and sometimes you can tell. Yeah. There's sometimes a kind of unmistakable pattern to the identical words, the identical sentiment, the identical yeah. photograph, the identical, you know. So uh, it's, what's interesting to me is it really comes out on Twitter yeah. because uh, you don't have to reveal your real identity. Yeah. You know, Facebook actually, for the most part, People are revealing their true identity. I'm not really just saying this because I'm on Facebook, but uh, because of that, there is a kind of discipline that people have that they just they're not going to be assholes if right. you know their name, if you know who they are, if their friends in a sense are going to see it. Mm -hmm. On Twitter, you see the dark side of people. Right. You see the the venom and you see the bile, and it's you know I mean it just reminds you <laughs> some dark stuff. There. Yeah, yeah. Well, were you not? I was. A little blown away that some, because you know, like I've seen an uptick on my social feed too. And I, be honest, perhaps I was naive before. I didn't think there was so much of that stuff out there. And perhaps it was always there and just quieter and now it's emboldened. Uh, do you think it's a new phenomenon or do you think it's a, it a unsaid thing that kind of came out? I think it's a really interesting question. And yeah. I, think, I think it's probably that there was a lot of it was there yeah. under the surface. Um, you know, I, I, I don't like political correctness any more yeah. than most people. I've written, I've spoken out against it, and mm -hmm. I think the left is too, too censorious. Yeah. But some of political correctness was just... Considerate. Like good manners, right? right? right like, right. You, yeah, don't be blatantly racist yeah. or sexist yeah. or homophobic. You know, what, what, it's like it's not nice. It's, yeah. not, it's rude, and it's particular to people that have historically been disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. um, People now feel emboldened. Mm -hmm. And to me, the most interesting one has been the uptick of anti-Semitism. Yeah. Because I think there's no question Donald Trump is not an anti-Semite. He has Jewish grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he doesn't want the. But the truth is, you open up a Pandora's box. You give people permission to, f to, to think their darkest thoughts. Yeah. Their darkest thoughts are not your darkest thoughts. You, know, right, right, right. you might be talking about Mexican rapists and yeah. Muslims. But they've got other things on their mind. And, you know, you, so you talk to people in, um, at synagogues, at JCCs, and they all are experiencing a very significant uptick mm -hmm. in threats, in rhetoric. And it's, it's just so, so sad that right. in America, you know, the one place I think that one of the great things America could take pride for was 
the world had been, you know, for centuries anti-Semitic, and America had always been able to be this incredible place of, of you know, not just a refuge, but a place where people could proudly right. be Jewish. And now to see this very startling rise, and we saw it in the Charlottesville thing, that, yeah. you know, the chants, I didn't even understand them, don't yeah. replace us with Jews. Yeah, yeah. I didn't understand what, what that meant, like, you know. Of all the issues Jews yeah, have, yeah, yeah, yeah. like massive fertility and overproduction, <laughs> that doesn't strike me that it's going to happen. Yeah. But uh, does a lot of that have to do with the uh, the bubble effect that we're talking about? Um, like, uh, I'll give a few examples. We had uh, Bill Nye on like a few weeks ago. Uh, Bill Nye's, I think, pretty down the center. Just like he loves science and all that, but he's kind of become like a, a right wing uh, whipping boy. Um, like, I'll be honest. Like, even having you on, like some people have just like like wrote comments. You, I find, are the most down the line, you're, you, you have, you're outwardly critical of the left and the right. I mean, if you want someone who's kind of like to give you uh, a good view of what's going on in the world, this is a good guy. And, but like, you kind of like, but even that's just like you, people who I don't think, they might not even know who you are, but they feel the need to kind of like speak out. And I feel like that's part of the ease of communication on something like Twitter yeah. and part of the, the bubble effect is that they're only watching, say, Alex Jones yeah. or something yeah. like that. Um, but uh, like, I think you said you, that you don't think there's a way around that. You don't think... You, you know, I, yeah. I worry a lot about that because yeah. you're absolutely right. I, I really do try to ask myself, like, on this issue, where would I come out? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it put, puts me on the left, sometimes it puts me on the right. And, you know, honestly, I probably am more left of center than right of center yeah. these days. But that's partly because the right has moved a lot. I was a big Reaganite in college, for example. Yeah. I don't think I've changed that much. But um, what people do, what's interesting is that this, the system almost does not allow you to weigh things on an issue-by-issue issue basis. Mm -hmm. Even on television, I notice, like, you have to be reliably left-wing or right-wing. Yeah. You know, if so you look at... So I looked at somebody like uh, Jeffrey Lord, who was a CNN, you know, yeah. the Trump supporter. And I, I would talk to him in the green room. He's a lovely guy. Yeah. And I would always think to myself, I think the guy generally supports Trump. But he knows that he can't say, well, on these three things, I disagree with Trump. Yeah. Like, he's on CNN because he is a Trump supporter. Right, right, right. He's got to support Donald Trump, yeah. whatever Donald Trump does. And the people who criticize can't, you know, so... I find myself occasionally, I've, support, I've said that Trump did the right thing. Yeah. I think he did the right thing on the serious strikes. Mm -hmm. I think he's doing the right thing on deregulation in many areas, not yeah. environmental, but in the other business areas, I think he's doing the right thing. I think tax reform is a good idea. Yeah. But you say these things, and it's like it's heresy. You know, and then the truth is, some things are true, even if Donald Trump believes yeah. them. Even if, and you've got to be able to say that. Yeah. I think the country is more in the middle. But this is an area where the media competitive dynamic yeah. and the fact that your most ardent viewers tend to be on the flanks right. is a problem for American democracy because yeah. you're actually disserving the, the country and the, and, the, and the public because they are, you know, the largest single group identif uh, by, uh, by identification now is independence. Yeah, yeah. Who's serving them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm actually glad you brought up the point about like, the things you said nice about Donald Trump. Um, there was... In some circles, uh, you had the famous line about, the, about Donald Trump becoming president. Now, I didn't think it was that controversial. I understood what you were saying. But I, you know, I have in my Facebook feed, I have a lot of like, left-leaning people yeah, 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 yeah. here in New York City. They didn't like that comment so much. Um, I don't know. Now it's been a few months back. Uh, do you still agree with that comment? Or maybe do you want to explain to those detractors out yeah, there yeah. what you meant? Sure. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, this yeah. is what, when, when Trump um, authorized the serious strikes, yeah. I said... Uh, I think he's become president. I think I probably, in retrospect, what I would have liked to have said is, and this is TV, you know, yeah. it's a spur of the moment, I think he acted in a presidential way yeah. is probably what I would have, you know, what, what the sentiment was. I, look, I'm comfortable, you, you know, I'm a big boy. I said what I said and I, I, I will stand by it. But let me explain why I was saying it. And I, and I proceeded and it succeeded. I said, you know, Trump so far has campaigned on this narrow self-interested self foreign policy of America first, America only, mm -hmm. we're never going to care about anything. What he did in Syria was more important than what he did is how he explained it. Mm -hmm. He said what Syria has done is a violation of international human rights, it's a violation of, tre of a treaty that they made with us, uh, it's a violation of promises that were made, mm -hmm. and in order to uphold some of these international standards and norms, I think the United States has to be the world leader and we're going we're gonna to punish them for it. Yeah. I thought that was, in a sense, evoking the historic role of the United States and the historic role the President of the United States mm -hmm. plays. And I was pleased and I thought, you know, anytime Trump does something that I think is, is good, I want to encourage it. because yeah. I, I don't want him to fail because yeah. it means America fails. I, I would like to see more of that. I then subsequently, you know, the rest of my commentary that was, 
He has no. He has a completely incoherent Syria policy. Right. It's not clear what the hell he wants to do. One day he wants to get out. One day he wants to bomb. So it was pretty critical of him. Yeah. But that piece of it, I do think, A, I, I support, I, I continue to, to uh, stand by what I said in, in that particular case. But I also think that the, there's a larger issue that Trump, you know, opponents have to really grapple with. Uh -huh. Do you really want him to, to, to fail so badly that you're willing to take down the country? Right. right? Do you, you know, do you really want to say that you want this whole, the whole thing to crash and burn and never, never mind what happens. And, and I'm like, I don't feel that way. I'll give you an example. On Obamacare, there were a lot of people who said, I kind of wish the Republicans had managed to repeal. Uh -huh. Because then you would have 20 million people who would lose their health care, many of them Trump voters. Right. And they would realize, you know, it's like, I don't want to play games with people's lives like that. Right. I'm glad that the, the whole thing collapsed. And I'm glad that people still have their health care. I, I don't want to play this political game with people's lives. Uh -huh. You know, and that's partly, I think, you know, do you, do you, are you in this to make a point or are you in this to help you, you know, to make a difference, to right. help people? So I, I, I think, yeah, when, when Trump does something that I think is the right thing, mm -hmm. I'm going to not only say it, but I'm going to say it in a way that I hope encourages him. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, we do know since the president basically does nothing other than watch cable news, right. you actually have a chance of influencing him. Uh, so yesterday we had Baratunde Thurston in here, and we had a, uh, a little back and forth about uh, Donald Trump's uh, Twitter usage. Now, um, he, and we're just talking about like being presidential and all that. Now, uh, he, uh, Donald Trump a few months ago, or maybe a month ago, he was being criticized for not being presidential enough. So he tweeted out, I'm being modern presidential. And you know what? I don't think he's exactly wrong. And I'll uh, explain what I mean. Is that not so much in his attitude, but, you know, I think... I didn't know a septuagenarian, uh, you know, supposed billionaire would be the first person to do it, but I think that we're going to expect our presidents to be on Twitter, to be kind of transparent, to kind of going off the cuff, and to kind of always be available through the media. So I don't think he was wrong on that, and he might also not be wrong of like starting beefs and starting fights with people. That's kind of just what the media scape and communication is in 2017. Is, is he wrong? And, and do we? I don't think we ever go back for sure. <laughs> So I think you're absolutely right that yeah. he has f he has found this medium uh, to work for him, yeah. and you're not going to uninvent it. You're not going to take away that direct channel that that presidents will want, mm -hmm. and I think that's that's great. I think you could use it for different reasons. Right. You could use it to elevate the conversation. Yeah. You could use it to bring people together. You could use it to, in some way or the other, you know, kind of uh, I don't know, show leadership and heal wounds. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not a, I, people sometimes think that I'm this, I, you know, Ob Obama worshiper. I'm not. I have I had many problems with his presidency, but yeah. I think he actually used Twitter very well. And he's used it in the wake of, of, of uh, Charlottesville very well. I don't yeah. know if you saw this beautiful tweet that he did in three parts, quoting from Mandela, mm -hmm. pointing out that, you know, Mandela said, no, no child is born hating other people. They are taught to hate. And if they are taught to hate, they can be taught to to, uh, to love, because it, love is actually a more powerful emotion. A very sweet, you know, very um, moving uh, a tweet. Like, that's a, that's a good use of Twitter. Yeah. That's an effective use of Twitter. You don't have to just use it for bile and venom and, you know, personal uh, grudges. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the part that, let's be, let's be honest, Trump uses Twitter a lot to lie, yeah. to say things that are not factually true, yeah. because the media is reporting things that are actually factually true. And so, yes, you can say it's his, his end run around the media. It is also his end run around truth. Mm -hmm. uh, let's maybe just uh, uh, you know, wrap up on, with, with some politics, if that's okay. Um, so if you listen to Trump's biggest supporters, like someone like Scott Adams or Newt Gingrich, they say that you know, his seemingly erotic behavior, that's him playing 4D chess that no one else can understand. Um, do you th and, and actually, but if you also look at Trump's interviews from 20 years ago, he's a different person than he is now. Um, do you think there's anything purposeful and strategic in his behavior, or is he, as many of us see, an increasingly unstable toddler king? <laughs> no, I think that I think it's sort of somewhere in the between. Okay. I think that he's politically he has very good instincts, okay. and I think his instincts are basically the instincts of a salesman. Okay. A good salesman knows his audience, mm -hmm. gets to know his audience, and I think what happened, for example, give you tr Trump's uh, political instincts. Mm -hmm. He's up against 16 serious Republican candidates. Uh -huh. and, he, and they're going around the country, and Trump realizes, really alone, that the base of the Republican Party is in a very different place than the elites of the party uh -huh. are. The elites are still basically into the Reagan formula. Yeah. Free trade, free markets, low taxes, entitlement reform, aggressive American foreign policy. Right. 
Trump realizes that out there, those guys don't care about any of those five yeah. things. What they want to hear about are Mexicans, Muslims, yeah. Chinese people, jobs, you know, the political correctness. Right, right. Right? So he finds this socially conservative populist base of the party, and he plays to it. And that was a political yeah, act of political genius. Do you, you know, think he's, it's genuine on his part? I don't think it's genuine in the yeah. sense that I don't think he believes any of it. Okay. He's just doing what he thinks the audience wants to hear. Right, right. Like, if you want him to, if you want him to say that his condo is 2,000 square feet and has a wood-burning fireplace, yeah. he'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether it has it or not is a separate issue. Right, That's right, right, that He's a good salesman. Right, and right. when you come back to him and say, well, there was no, no fireplace, he'll say, yeah. well, there was a mantelpiece. Yeah, and yeah. So, you know, it's a sort of a fireplace. Right, right, right. right. But, so I don't think he believes it in his core. I don't think he believes anything in his core other than himself. Right. He's, he's a narcissist. But he has that political skill. And so even if you look at the Charlottesville thing, mm -hmm. It looks to us like it's bad strategy, and I think at some level it is. If you ask yourself, how are you going to get to a 50% approval rating? Yeah. But maybe he has understood that his path to success is holding on to this 35 to 40% tenaciously. Yeah, yeah. And that that 35 to 40% does include a lot of people who have the views that he is stoking and stroking. Maybe, you know, maybe that's the genius. I don't yeah. know that it's... A strategy. I think it's not wisdom, right. but there's something there. And to your point about him changing, yeah, look, there's something going on. If yeah. you look at in that special we did, how Trump won, yep. the guy 25 years ago was a very different person. Yeah. He was, first of all, he seems in comparison today, he seems to have ADD. Yeah. Like in the 25 years ago, he could complete his sentences, he complete his thoughts, speak in paragraphs. He was also quite sweet. Right. You know, he was a more gentle uh, person. He was more introspective, yeah, yeah. Um, much less combative. So, I don't know, man. That, there maybe he's invented and reinvented and reinvented himself in light of fame and money and celebrity and ambition. Maybe that happens. But the part that I do think has stayed constant is he's a very good salesman. Yeah. People, I think, shouldn't underestimate that. Um, let's say that the Mueller report comes back and they find something bad. Now, there's no indication that that, that happened. They might find nothing. That could happen. But let's say they find something bad and then um, he's impeached. Uh, what happens next? See, my nightmare is actually that they find something bad yeah, yeah. and they issue the report. Mm -hmm. And unlike Nixon, Trump does not accept the judicial process as right. it were. He fights it. Yeah. He gets out on the streets. He tells people this is, you know, He's already done that with discrediting of Mueller, discredit, and so what you end up with is, for the first time, really since the end of the Civil War, mm -hmm. a situation where um, the President of the United States is actively undermining the institutions of the Amer mm -hmm. of, Amer of American democracy, and basically telling people, "Don't, don't accept this. Right. Go out on the streets, protest." Because what he's trying to do is to get the House not to impeach him and the Senate not to convict him, because. You know, the thing with the president is there's no legal issue. It's all a political issue. Right. Uh, if he does that, if he sort of goes to the mattresses, in, to use the, God, the, the phrase from The Godfather, um, I don't know what will happen. I don't know what that 35% will, will believe. There was one very disturbing poll where they asked uh, Republicans, if they would postpone, you know, if they would postpone yeah, the yeah. election, to make, to make the next presidential election, to make sure, until we can be sure there are no illegal aliens voting. Now, right. there's no evidence that any have voted. But the fact that you got a disturbingly high percentage of people who said, yes, we would be willing to postpone the elections, mm -hmm. it tells you there are a lot of people there who will listen to what he says. Mm -hmm. That's, to me, the, the worst case scenario. If he is impeached and resigns and Mike Pence becomes president, he's a very conservative president, yeah. that is what it is. That's yeah. fine. I mean, we can deal with that. I've always said there's a big difference between Trump's radical ideology yeah. And the radical assault on American democracy, yeah. the attacking of the judges, the attacking of the media, the attack that's the real danger. Yeah. The radical stuff, I mean, fine. You, you get elected and you want to cut taxes, you want to give more money to the rich, whatever it is you want, that's, you know, I mean, elections have consequences. Right. Um, so let's actually maybe finish up. So we do a lightning round uh, where we ask the same 10 questions to each guest. Uh, we say lightning round, but uh, if, you know, if you want to go longer, though the floor is yours, um, do you use Windows or Mac? Mac. Okay. Uh, Android or iOS? iOS. Okay. Uh, have you recently come across a piece of technology that made you think, wow, I'm really living in the future? Um, that is a very good question. In the last, um, not in the last three or four months, I would say that I, I've been, I think that Alexa and the Google voice recognition stuff right. is going to get there. Yeah. I still find it clunky, but 
I think that that, to me, that seems to be the next big thing sure. that's going to happen. Yeah. Which, I mean, and the most important part yeah. about it is the hands-free part. Yeah. You know? I mean, you also probably remember, um, uh, like, I remember about like 10, 15 years ago, they used to have like the voice to diction type, which yeah. I never had in my first yeah. job. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, that's the technology the, yeah. has really come yeah. along. Yeah. It yeah, makes yeah. you realize also that's very hard oh, yeah, yeah. because it's taken. I remember actually investing very briefly during the <laughs> in, in, in the 90s dot com yeah. boom in a company that had very good voice recognition technology yeah. and was promising to transform the world. And it didn't, you know, right. like many of those things didn't work right, out. Right. But the fact that, you know, 15 years later, we're still kind of getting there. Yeah. It's, you know. um, where were we? Uh, when you're waiting in line at the store, what is the first app you open on your phone to pass the time? Uh, um, newspaper apps. You I mean, up. I look at New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, and I read up. I sort of have now taken to reading the newspaper in a very different way than I mm -hmm. used to. I, I, I start my day by kind of starting to work. Yeah. And as I, I, as I have time, I fill it up through the day by reading the right. newspapers. But um, I, don't, I don't know if the camera sees it's not real newspaper. That's right. He I came, have, in, he yeah, came, he came yeah. in holding the yeah. real paper. I have real papers yeah. because if you're in a cab, if yeah. you're in a subway, yeah. if you're waiting, if I get here early, yeah. it's, the physical paper is much more browsable yeah. than, than, than the web. The web, you think about it, you can read one story, then you press buttons, load, backload. You open a newspaper, you've got 15 stories that you can look at very quickly, mm -hmm. and in five minutes you can browse the whole paper. So I still think that that, that technology of right. dead, dead trees is, uh, is still pretty amazing. Um, Ed Snowden, traitor or hero? You know, I, I, I'm sort of somewhere in between. I, I, uh, I debated him once, mm -hmm. and I thought he was a very bright, thoughtful guy. Yeah. Uh, I understand what he's motivated by. Um, I think that... He's allowed himself to be used by some bad forces, mm -hmm. so the Russians, Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. But I think at the end of the day, you know, he's a, he's, he's a genuinely well-meaning person who did some good things and some bad things. I would wish there were a way for him to come and like a real conscientious dissenter, face a trial and be given a short sentence to, to recognize that, you know, you don't just spill CIA secrets with your endang endangering their lives, mm -hmm. you're endangering the lives of a lot of dissidents who have been, been supported by the United States, you're endangering a lot of very sensitive things that the United States has been working on. But he did, he did reveal to us stuff that we would not have known if right. not for, Ed, uh, for Snowden. What is up with Julian Assange? Is it not, not lightning? Like, I mean, if you read his Twitter feed and stuff, he's kind of taking a Russian line on a lot of things. And I was kind of like, you know, semi a Julian Assange fan and then just like, I thought he was kind of an anarchist. He was against all governments, but he seems to be taking sides. Well, I think that so there are two possible interpretations, it yeah. seems to me. One is that there's just this bizarre, you know, nobody quite understands because, as you say, he starts out in, that, in this way. Yeah. And it's not just the Russians. He has never done a big data dump on any dictatorship, right. really. Right? I mean, not the Russians, not the Chinese. And I, I think it's a fair assumption that there are more human rights abuses in Russia than in the United States, and yeah. in China than in the United States, and Turkey than in the United States. Somehow nothing. So one possibility is that he, that, you know, that he is in some way in cahoots right. with, with some of these regimes, principally Russia. Uh, the other is that he has a very misguided sense of priorities, um, you know, which sometimes does happen with people on the kind of far left where they get so fixated on America's flaws, mm -hmm. which are real, that they forget that, yeah, that's all true, but it's, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. If you look at what the Russians did when they've had power, and you look at what Britain did when they had power, French did when they had power. I mean, you know, I remember reading during the Iraq war, people comparing it to France's uh, um, occupation of Algeria. When the Algerians revolted, the French savage war of reprisals killed one million Algerians, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, the United States and Iraq did bad things, but it's just, you know, there's a whole order of magnitude where people are missing, and that, that sense may be part of what's going on. Uh, I don't know, but I increasingly wonder whether it's actually more nefarious than yeah. that. Have you ever interviewed him? No. 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 Um, back to the lightning round. Will the singularity occur in 2054? I feel like that's above my pay grade. Okay. I, 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 know, I know the issue, and I think for me to opine on it would just be bullshit. Okay. I don't know. Fair enough. Uh, is there intelligent life out there in the universe? You've got to figure the odds. You know, I mean, if you think about how large the universe is, yeah, yeah. the chance that we are literally the only place where the biology and chemistry combine to produce the possibility of organic mm. life 
uh, seems very, very remote. Okay. Uh, is Bigfoot out there? I've been around. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. You're, you're originally from India? Yeah, I'm from uh, India. Did, what was the, uh, the Bigfoot equivalent of like the, the mystical creature that some people said they saw? Oh, God. I mean, in yeah. India, it's, India is a land of 200 million gods, goddesses. Yeah. There, it's, it's, every, every, everyone's seeing something every right, day, right, right. you know. Um, and then I'll throw in a bonus one. Uh, so we had Van Jones in a, a few months back. He says he believes in ghosts. Do you believe in ghosts? You know, no. no? I mean, I'm, okay. I'm pretty much a rationalist. I, I'll tell you what I do believe. I do believe that, I, I, I don't know if I'd call it the soul, but I yeah. believe that there's something deeper mm -hmm. that, that we don't understand yet about human beings and about life and, and, and all of it. And maybe science will be able to uncover it. The brain is a very, very complicated instrument yep. and we don't understand it. But I don't think it's, it's all chemistry. I think there's something, something beyond. Um, we did Bigfoot. Uh, what is your go-to drink at the bar? Wine. Wine. I don't drink any hard liquor. Yeah, okay. yeah. But White, I, red. I, I drink a, a lot of both. A lot of all, all, okay. all of the above. All right. <laughs> uh, we're in the golden age of television. Uh, what are you watching these days? So these days, I'm watching on Netflix uh, the uh, Oliver Stone's People History of the United States okay. because I I always think it's very important to watch stuff that I don't agree with. Yeah. I don't generally. I've read the Howard Zinn book. I don't agree with it, which is what it's based on. Yeah. Um, and again, on these on these lines, I don't think that. He's so much wrong, but it's a matter of emphasis and a matter of comparison with other countries. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to watch it, and I wanted to see what Oliver Stone did. And, uh, you know, I, I've just watched the first episode, mm -hmm. and actually it's pretty good. It's, okay. not, it's not massively biased. It's about World War II, and it's a slightly, uh, shall we say, more charitable view of Stalin okay. than, uh, than conventional history. But, you know, he makes a plausible case. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, it's, and it's good stuff. He's, a good, you know, he's, he's yeah. good at what he does. It's, it's compelling television. Um, then did you watch the, the Oliver Stone uh, Putin interview? I, I, you know, I watched in, in excerpts of it. Yeah. I thought it was just so naive. I yeah. mean, I've interviewed Putin, yeah. and he's a very smart guy. Okay. You really have to ask yourself, uh, what game is he playing? Yeah. How do you prepare for it? I thought Megyn Kelly did a pretty good job. I think I did a pretty good job. Yeah. I think the Oliver Stone thing was bizarrely non-confrontational. Again, yeah. it's this weird thing where if Oliver Stone had done an interview like that, with the president of the United States, people would describe it as a love, you know, yeah. as you know what I mean, uh, a something job. And when he does it with Putin, everyone's like, "Oh, this is great. This is so thoughtful." Yeah. No, you just, you know, you just allowed Russian propaganda to yeah. be to to, to, to vent uh, un, uncontested for an hour. I thought it was for hours. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was very bizarre. I mean, I thought it was very smart of uh, Putin yeah. to give him that that uh, interview. Yeah. But Sad that, uh, as, as our president would say, sad. <laughs> did, you, did you interview Putin uh, in person or uh, remotely? In person. In person. Okay, so just give me a quick story. Like, before the cameras roll on or in, and afterwards, is he like a guy? Does he joke around? Like, what's... He's shorter than you'd think. Okay. Uh, he looks kind of like a little bit like a bald accountant type. He's not, okay. that, he's not that impressive in that yeah. sense, uh, particularly when he's wearing a suit. I don't get to see the yeah. manly <laughs> chest. Yeah, yeah. Um, he is um, pleasant enough. Okay. Um, very, smile? Very focused, not so much smile. Okay. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I know warm but cordial, you know, yeah. so we chatted a little bit in the green room before. Yeah. What I was struck by, very purposeful. So we were in the green room with uh, the Italian Prime Minister, mm -hmm. the President of Kazakhstan, myself. And, you know, this is just pleasantries. And he mm -hmm. takes that moment to go after the Italians on the sanctions. Okay. He says, why are you joining in with the, with the sanctions? The yeah. Americans want these sanctions. But they don't do any business with Russia, so they don't pay any price. Yeah. So you're paying for American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. he, would turn, he turned to the Prime Minister of Italy and he said, you're paying for his foreign policy, meaning me, the yeah. American in the room. And I thought it was very interesting that even in that short period, he's very pur purposeful, yeah. he's very strategic, he's very well briefed. You know, so he's, he's not mi missing opportunities to advance. You know, and, he, so, and, he, and, and then on the stage, he's very smart. He can, right. you know, whatever I ask, he can... He can he, he has a good answer for everything, mm -hmm. so I've always wondered why he didn't do more interviews, because he's actually very smart. He can, he, can, he can hold his own in any circumstance. Uh, and then at the end of the interview, he was very, he was very friendly, and we talked a little bit about uh, missed opportunities, how Russia and America could have been better friends, mm -hmm. and he was talking about how he and Clinton had a good, had, used to have good uh, exchanges about this. So, you know, it was all kind of, 
I wouldn't say warm, but it was cordial. Right, right, right. Uh, Frieza Kari, we're running out of time, and uh, I mean, I could go for another three hours. My bosses, your bosses might not like that so much. Uh, this has been amazing. Um, for anybody watching this, give us a like, give us a share. We appreciate those. Uh, check out some of our past interviews. We've done a lot of these. Uh, Convo is also an audio podcast available wherever you get your audio podcast. Um, oh, maybe I should ask you anything you want to plug, anything people should check out of yours. So the, we have this special called yeah. Why Trump One, which has been on CNN. It's going to run again and again. Um, on video check on it demand, out. I'm sure. And, and you can yeah. get it just, yeah, if you Google it, you'll find a hundred different ways to see yeah. it but see it it's really good um, well thanks to everyone thanks to social Jose filling in thanks to producer West and thanks to photographer Tony filling in and Sheila there once again my, my audience member um, and as always be good to each other peace <laughs>